praise the Most High. Come, all you people, come and praise the Most High. Come, all you people, come and praise the Most High. Come now and worship the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord, Lord. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The fourth Sunday of Easter is often referred to as Good Shepherd Sunday because the lectionary provides us with passages rich with the beloved image of Christ as our shepherd. Today we hear again the 23rd Psalm one of the most widely recognized texts of all scripture. And if you've been worshiping regularly this year and feel like you've heard Psalm 23 not so long ago, you're not mistaken. We last heard Psalm 23 on March 19th, the fourth Sunday in Lent, in connection with Jesus healing the man who was born blind from birth. I began that sermon that morning by asking a question and sharing a memory from my childhood. And I'm not going to test your memory. <laughs> I'm going to give it to you. The question was this. When you think of Jesus, is there a particular image that you see? What does Jesus look like to you? I then shared about a stained glass window in my hometown church in Illinois that depicts Jesus holding a lamb over his shoulders and how as a child I would look at that window and the others around the sanctuary to get a sense of, of what Jesus looked like. What did this man Jesus look like? Of course, the windows were an artist's rendering of Jesus, but they gave color and vitality to the stories that I heard. and They drew me in deeper into the mysteries of faith. They fed my imagination and spoke of timeless truths. Now, these are all realizations that I make now as an adult, of course. As a child, I just wanted to be that little lamb resting effortlessly on Jesus' shoulders. Because the window certainly made it look like a happy existence. Now, after that sermon back in March, I had several conversations with you about the images of Jesus that you carry with you in your walk of faith. And I thank you for sharing those with me. It never ceases to amaze me how influential art can be in our lives. Jesus said to them, I am the good shepherd. Throughout John's Gospel, we experience this wide array of responses to Jesus' words and actions and teachings. 
And this is definitely the case in chapter 10, where our gospel reading this morning comes from. Jesus has been in Jerusalem since his arrival for the Festival of Booths, three chapters before, teaching regularly in the temple. His teaching is causing a lot of discussion about his identity, his origins, his authority, and results in, in this division among the people. Some believe that he is the Messiah, and others believe that he's demon-possessed, or worse, a blasphemer who is deserving of death. After the first part of Jesus' words about being the gate for the sheep, whereby those who enter will find pasture and be saved, he says plainly that he is the Good Shepherd. And there is once again a divided response. Just after today's passage, we read, Again, the Jews were divided because of these words. Many of them were saying, He has a demon and is out of his mind. Why listen to him? Others were saying, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? After this, some time passes. We're not told exactly how much, but the festival of the dedication has taken place, which begins the season of Hanukkah. Once again, Jesus is at the temple, and this time he's in the portico of Solomon, which is the location where the kings of Israel would traditionally declare judgments. Some Jews gather around him and ask Jesus to put an end, finally, to the debate concerning his identity. How long will you keep us in suspense? They ask him, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. The problem here, though, is that regardless of what Jesus says or does, the debate does not end. Jesus responds that he has already told them and that the works he has done in his Father's name testify to him. But they do not believe because they do not belong to his sheep. Now the words and works of Jesus are open to many interpretations to his first listeners. One moment in the previous chapter makes that abundantly clear. After Jesus heals the man who was born blind, the Pharisees see only that Jesus has healed on the Sabbath and that therefore he must be a sinner while others question how a sinner could possibly perform such signs. The blind man eventually comes to realize who Jesus is and, in the end, worships him as Lord. Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. There's a tension there's a tension between God's action and human response that is ongoing throughout John's Gospel. It is only with the eyes of faith that we can see the truth concerning Jesus. Those who belong to Jesus, who hear and recognize his voice and follow him, have been given to him by the Father. Everything, everything depends on God's action. God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And at the same time, the result of Jesus' coming into the world is that those who do not believe, we are told, are subject to judgment. Now, thankfully, it's not our task as Christians, to, as Christians today to resolve that tension. Neither is it our task to argue people into faith with convincing words. Not even Jesus could do that. But we can declare the promise that creates and sustains faith. The promise of the Good Shepherd to give us, each of us, eternal life. The promise that no one will be able to snatch us out of his hand. And along with that declaration, we also need to discern the shepherd's voice amidst all the other voices that seek our attention, many of whom claim to speak for God. 
These voices are many, but we do not always recognize how contrary they are to the voice of the Good Shepherd. For example, there are many voices that tell us how to grow closer to God by having a particular religious experience, by believing the correct doctrine, by reaching some higher level of knowledge or a higher level of morality or spirituality. And culturally speaking, these voices may often sound good or right. But by contrast, the Good Shepherd tells us that everything, everything, depends on belonging to Him. Never does our status before God depend on how we feel, or on having the right experience, or on being free of doubt or questions, or on what we accomplish. It depends on one thing only, that we are known by the shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. The voice of the Good Shepherd is a voice that frees us rather than oppresses us. It does not say, do this, and then maybe you will be good enough to be one of my sheep. It says, you belong to me already. No one can snatch you out of my hand. And secure in this belonging to our Good Shepherd, we are free to live the abundant life of which Jesus spoke in today's passage. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The abundant life of Jesus speaks of not necessarily abundance in years, or in wealth, or status, or accomplishments. It is life that is abundant in the love of God made known in Jesus. The love that overflows to others openly and freely and generously. It is eternal life because its source is in God, who is eternal, and in Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. And so amidst all the other voices that <clears throat> stir up within us fear or voices that create demands on our lives or, or even give advice, the voice of the Good Shepherd is a voice of promise, a voice that calls us by name and claims us as God's own beside the still waters of baptism. And so all praise and glory be to our risen Lord, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd of us, the sheep. Amen. 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 Amen.